We're rolling on in 2024, yet to concede. And in the last 22 matches, all competitions, just two defeats. That's the glass half full viewpoint. The glass half empty, goals have been hard to come by of late. So let's review. Chelsea nil, Aston Villa nil. Now, I don't know about you, but when that final whistle sounded, my first instinct was to think, oh, we don't need a replay with our injuries and the fixture congestion and all that. But upon sober second analysis, February actually isn't that onerous a month fixture-wise, and that's thanks in part to not having to play a two-legged playoff round in the Europa Conference League. Thank goodness for that. And then when thinking back to some of the foibles that we created that led to some very good Chelsea chances in front of goal. Well, maybe we should be grateful and just take the replay at Fortress Villa Park. Even from 7,400 kilometers away, I could tell you that was class support from the Villa faithful, 6,000 strong, one of whom, Max Stokes, of course, from Villa on tour, there he is in London, warming up for the game, and he finds a Holy Trinity show beer mat how randomly awesome is that and thanks for sending the picture over maximilian now i'm not saying i'm mailing this show in but it sort of does feel like in essence i'm doing a halftime show <laughs> in a way and this is the holy trinity show where i dissect the three big moments or issues that defined a game of bagels as we like to say in canada and statistically it is amazing how even this game turned out to be Although we did get the better of it in a couple of categories, including Jules 1 and also XG, but it's remarkable. We had seven corners each, 11 throw-ins each, accurate crosses and long balls almost dead even, and it turned into a very decent contest, even though much of that first half did feel like we were up against it. Isn't it funny that when the officials list came out earlier this week, people looked and said, well, there's no VAR scheduled for this game, even though it's an all Premier League clash. And people had a meltdown saying, we're going to get done in now by our high line and a marginal offside call not given. Well, if there was no VAR in this game... Douglas Louise's goal would have probably counted because referee Rob Jones did not see the little glance off of the Brazilian's hand and the assistant referee kept the flag down on the second phase of that corner. So that goal probably would have counted, but I still cannot believe that VAR isn't unilaterally applied to all the games in the round or the competition or unilaterally not applied they got to make up their mind on this. First honorable mention has to be the strength of the side we put out at the bridge on Friday, and Chelsea's was no slouch either, and maybe that's a function of our minor injury problems right now, but if we are fully fit and everybody's available, obviously it's Torres for Longley, maybe Bailey for Diaby or Tielemans, maybe Luca Dean for Alex Moreno. Otherwise, this is a decent group here. And if you're Maurizio Pochettino, are you saying to your team, get after them, get after them early, get after them often, over and over, and for goodness sakes, get the first goal? Because we played on Tuesday and that might catch up with us if we don't build up a lead here. And that kind of played out, you know. And sure enough... Villa, after looking like they were truly up against the ropes, especially in the back half of the first 45 minutes, we started to come into that game. We started to get a hold of that game. We created chances. You saw the stats. We had more shots. We had a better XG, which meant we got into better goal scoring areas than the home side. And I think we should probably feel even a little bit disappointed that we didn't do better with the chances we had, and is that partially because Chelsea started to fall off a little bit, given that there was only two days between their cup clashes? Of our players who looked slightly out of sync was Yuri Tielemans, and I'm going to forgive him for that. I was actually just happy to see him playing again because he got 26 minutes at Everton, but before that, he hadn't played since Arsenal. So a mid-season form type Yuri Tielemans probably wouldn't have headed that early chance straight into the ground because that was a good chance. But the one in first half stoppage time, if he is purring along 
at a nice clip and in form. He's just slotting that in step along the floor. And we're going into halftime with a 1-0 lead. I would also like to acknowledge the contributions of Nicolo Zaniolo as a substitute. Did he get frosted tips? Or did he spend a fair bit of time in the sun on his vacation? Regardless, he made some sound and mature and tidy decisions even in the short time that he was on. I'm big on body language. This lad exudes confidence. He radiates it, frankly. And I've been watching a lot of the training video that the club puts out on the website and the amount of times when he's slotting home with regularity and the coaching staff says, good job, Nicolo. Well done, Nicolo. Good, Nicolo. Good, Nicolo. Considering that every other Aston Villa player in the squad pretty much has improved dramatically under Unai Emery, I've turned around. I'm now expecting Big moments from the big Italian down the stretch. Big moment number three, cash deposit denied. Poor Matt Cash does get pummeled by factions of our fan base at times, does he not? And in this game, he gets headshot beamed twice by errant clearances. He neutralized Raheem Sterling for the most part, and he probably had the best chance of the game and also had a great one that he set up too, where he gets to the byline and he fizzes it into a beautiful area and we couldn't convert. And that came three minutes after. He was frankly robbed by Georgi Petrovic with a great save. And I always wonder what goes through a player's mind when their club signs another player in their position, especially somebody as promising as Kosta Nadelkovic, who I'll talk about more at the end of the month when the window's closed, because this guy is rated as the fourth best right back in all of Europe for players born 2005 and later. He is a blue chip prospect. And of course, Unai Emery recalled Kane Kessler Hayden from Plymouth Argyle as well. So what does that do to Matt Cash's mindset? Because some guys will go, uh-oh, other guys will go, pfft come get me. As far as the save in the 74th minute goes, I mean, Cash could have won the game in this situation, which was beautifully crafted, executed. The ball was weighted perfectly for him. I'm not sure if there's a better option in that particular situation, but you know what? I like a guy who says, I'm going to take the responsibility here, and he does everything right for me. He hits it true. It's going in the corner. It's a great save, and as much as Martinez provided heroics at the other end, I'll talk about that in a minute, Maybe the reason why this save was so impressive and probably the best save of the game was that Petrovic had hardly anything to do in this game while Martinez is getting peppered at the other end. Big issue number two, pressing problems. I'm not the only one who made this observation, but especially in that first half, it sure did look like Chelsea was kind of in mid-season form and we looked like a team that had just come from 12 days off and we probably needed those 12 days off. It's just a shame that during those 12 days off, we somehow gained more injuries with setbacks to Pau Torres and Jacob Ramsey and then a new injury to John Duran. But what I am encouraged by is how we fought through that pressure and we fought through that adversity. Maybe the most important thing about Aston Villa this season is their collective mentality and mental durability, frankly. Still, though, we were flummoxed by the amount of pressure Chelsea was putting on the ball all over the park, particularly in midfield via Connor Gallagher, among others. Cole Palmer up front. What a player he is. But still best friends with Morgan Rogers, who we're linked with, of course, from Borough. That goes back to the City days together. And we ask ourselves, okay, is this something that Chelsea is doing really effectively or is it something that Villa is not doing? And I would say... There's been noticeable progress since we last visited them in the fall. And actually, I kind of hope that Chelsea turns things on, keeping in mind that they're still missing a lot of players through injury. But I want them to win some of the games they weren't winning in the first half of the year, with two exceptions. The games against us. Where we really struggled, especially in that first half, was just getting out of our penalty area at times, or at least our defensive third while under pressure. And we didn't help ourselves with some, frankly, horrendous passing, Bubakar Kamara and Clement Longley among the guilty parties. But when you have one team that looks like it's clicking along in fourth, while the other is kind of stuck in second, then all the tactical planning and preparations and all the work on the training ground that week, that goes out the window as one team, the home team, is feeling it while the other, us, 
are thrashing around in the water trying to keep our head above it from drowning. And I have to say, it's one of the rare times when the combination of McGinn, Louise, Kamara, and Tielemans together didn't just look average, they looked like they were completely out of their depth. And I think, and I hope, that's just a one-off. Just before we get to number one, it's a big week ahead for this show's sponsor, 24-7 Services. I'll get more into that during the Newcastle review, but it's really big for them, and I'm thrilled to have been a part of it. And a lot of very good reviews for the new look and the new brand, which means the football club that Paul coaches, the 24-7 team, is going to have to update its kit and colors to the new vibrant green. I'm pretty convinced that Paul will only hire Villa fans with couple of exceptions in the northern branches. But I think he only hires competent footballers as well because Big Brad Gregory is like the Tyrone Mings of the team, the strapping, tall, powerful captain of the side, anchoring it all. They got a guy named Elias they pulled in from Morocco, and he was a pro in his former country. And Paul's the manager, who's been described as sort of like a cross between Neil Warnock and Jurgen Klopp without the big fake veneer teeth and, you know, the propensity to get tired and not want to carry on. By the way, buckle up for Unai Emery to Liverpool rumors now from the Sky 6 media. And the number one big issue that defined Chelsea nil, Villa nil, monstrous Martinez. This guy, holy moly. Earlier this season, especially at home, Villa provided so much run support, as they'd say in baseball, that Martinez didn't even really need to be clutch in most games. But now that the goals four have kind of dried up a little bit, every single one of his big actions is potentially a season-defining moment. And I know that sounds dramatic, but he doesn't make the save against Dominic Calvert-Lewin at Everton. Well, that's a point drop. How big could that point be? And I would argue that without Emmy Martinez, we're out of the FA Cup right now. Big Emmy was joking recently about how vitally important short sprints are, 10-yard sprints are suddenly in his game because now he is truly comfortable with his starting position in the high line and his decision-making has been, frankly, spot on. Whether he's coming out to win a 50-50 duel with the ball or making a save a couple of times, he even came out and cleared it up the touchline left-footed. I was actually worried he was going to pull a hamstring with one of those 10-yard bursts at the edge of his penalty area. And the not-so-funny aspect is so many of those opportunities were self-inflicted. We did it to ourselves with one bad pass and there he was either coming off his line really quickly and making himself big which sometimes led to the attacker rushing their shots or he'd make a save or make a clearance one of the other and I keep saying this over and over his big reputation is getting into people's heads and especially with younger players I feel they see this big guy a world cup winning Yashin trophy winning goalkeeper and they're thinking oh i got to be fine here, got to pick a corner because he's so big and he's so quick. And that is starting to become a thing, in my opinion. And this is where I really wish we could find a way to somehow augment, improve, upgrade, supplement our goal scoring. Ideally in this transfer window right now, I know it's hard to do, but I want to see this guy get a chance to achieve his dream of playing Champions League football with us. He's doing his part, frankly. And again, I ask the question, does Aston Villa earn some kind of bravery points in the front third and take on more risk because they know at the other end he is capable of coming up with point-earning moments? After the game, he's signing autographs, having selfies taken, chitting and chatting, being a charming guy who everybody seems to love, and basically just being the boss. And at every single away venue, he winds up the opposing fans. And he knows he's doing it, and he milks it. Which makes him part pantomime villain, part marquee attraction. And he's ours. And those are the kinds of players that attract bigger sponsors to your club, while also engaging fans digitally 
from outside of England, which leads me to the Deloitte report, which just came out two days after I put out my commercial show. Kind of a shame because that would have really helped me illustrate how far we have to go to grow the business and be amongst those big boys in the top 20. We're 21 right now, but we have a long way to go, which is why Chris Heck's job is so important. Because if we earn more revenue, we can bring in better players and we can retain better players. Because ultimately what every Aston Villa fan wants is to just simply be in the mix. Be in the mix over here. Be in the mix over here. Be in the mix over here and do it year upon year and maybe validate all that competitiveness by actually one day hoisting a trophy. You know this, a club's ground is the single biggest asset it has in order to generate the kind of revenue you need to get into that top 20 list that Deloitte laid out for us. And I need to reiterate my stance on Villa Park based on some of the comments I read in that commercial show. I have only ever known Villa Park. I love Villa Park. I was just as happy hanging around outside Villa Park with nothing going on and nobody inside. That's how cool it was to be there. And if I had a magic wand and could do whatever I want, you know what I would do? I would tear down both the North Stand and the Dugella Stand and build over Witten Street an L-shape, comprehensive, gorgeous grandstand or grandstands that connects with the other two. And I would divert the rail line and have it go straight into that grandstand. Now, of course, you'd need the train service to be able to provide the trains to make the game day a little bit easier to get in and out of. And in that kind of a redevelopment, or if you went full on spurs and rebuilt completely, you'd still have to move away for at least a couple of seasons. And that was what was so interesting about those AI generated renderings that Fabrizio Romano floated out on X not that long ago. For the first time we were given a tangible vision of something that we might not have ever considered before. A Victorian era stadium built from the ground up that was even more grand and cohesive than Villa Park. And that's the word I always and have always associated with Aston Villa. Grand. What a great word. What a grand club, historically, culturally. One of the 12 founding fathers. And in order to keep that status and grow that status, we're not entitled to it. You have to work hard to get there. But I'm now at the stage where I don't care about where or how. I think the club deserves to be there. Next up, huge game with Newcastle United on a Tuesday at Fortress Villa Park. And the last time these two teams met at VP was maybe one of the greatest days of my life because I got to witness in person one of the greatest performances under Unai Emery, eclipsed only probably by the Man City game this year. Maybe Brighton and Hove Albion, you could make that argument, but a comprehensive display. And it is a weird time for Tuesday's visitors right now. First of all, tons of injuries. Joe Linton is the latest, but Callum Wilson, Nick Pope, Willick, Harvey Barnes, and that's just some of them. And then this weird rumor that Kieran Trippier was linked with a move to Bayern Munich. I find that odd for both teams, quite frankly, because for Newcastle, I thought Trippier was kind of their leader and glue guy. And then you have this incredible lawsuit against their chairman, Yasser al Rumayan, 58 million pounds with wild accusations about the Saudi crown prince and malicious intent in many areas. This is exactly the kind of thing that Newcastle and the Premier League, frankly, wanted to avoid given the very cozy relationship between club and state. And then, of course, there's the form. Two wins in the last 10 in all competitions, and they had to play Fulham on Saturday at the time of recording. I don't know the score of that one, but that gives them one last day to prepare for the game on Tuesday at Villa Park, where they haven't won since 2013. And you know, maybe most dramatically of all, we are 14 points ahead of the Magpies right now, which is incredible given the opening season result. I mean, you talk about a turnaround in fortunes. They were the ones 
chasing Champions League football last year. So I'm already getting butterflies for our first home game of 2024. We're still missing a couple of key contributors, which is a worry, but oh my goodness, three points at Fortress Villa Park keeps us kind of in the mix, doesn't it? And here's some good news. F***ing January is almost over. Thank goodness this horrible month. And less than 40 days until daylight savings time, at least here in Canada. So until Newcastle, be well. And as always, up the mighty villa. Up the mighty villa.